All right. Good evening. Welcome. So as we get going, can I get a quick audio check? Is this working correctly? Y'all hear me? Yes, no, maybe so. All right, Lima Charlie, thank you. All right, let's get started. So it is just me tonight. We're going to be talking a bit about gear. This is something that's been on my mind a lot lately. If you haven't caught up with the previous interviews and, and uh, live streams I've done, articles on the website, you know, we've been going around this whole scenario X situation of, of the kind of trouble in your neighborhood, national disaster, you have to defend yourself. And all that's been really interesting. I've also been taking a lot of mental notes. So this uh, this uh, live stream is not about disaster preparedness or <laughs> the Russians coming over the border. Um, you know, I know I'm competing against the collapse of Ukraine right now, so I appreciate you being here to watch this with me. Uh, but no, this topic is about thinking about all those things in the context of like over here, what I want to do is talk to the new gun owners out there, because I think as a culture, Second Amendment culture, gun owners, gun enthusiasts, we tend to really go down a path of just let me go buy all the things. Let me go buy all the gear. And we go to message boards, we go to Instagram, and we see the influencers. Uh, we see uh, you know, all the people who seem like they have more money than, than reason, and they go buy a ton of stuff, and they make you feel like you need to buy that. Like if you don't, if you're, if you're a gear into owning firearms and you already own night vision and ballistic helmet, then what are you even doing, bro? You're going to, you're going to be dead in the street. And frankly, they're wrong. They, they're just, they're just wrong. That's not how it works. That's, that's honestly just irresponsible with your finances. So what I want to do is talk about the progression and have a conversation with you about the progression of where does someone start and what's actually important. And I'm coming at this from the perspective of a prepared citizen who is not looking to go to war with the government. I know that's a really popular theme of a lot of what we do, which is fine. Some people really like to prepare for that. I totally understand it. And I'm not going to say I don't think about those things, but really what I want to focus on is what does this progression look like for the average person who's just getting into it? What do they actually need to do when, you know, and when their focus is about being a, a good, prepared person? gun owner who is ready to go to that next level so um all right a couple comments coming in Let's say that one fatties on nine thank you um i i appreciate that you enjoy the advice so we'll keep doing it all right so what i'm going to do here is bring up the pyramid now i just did a podcast episode on this topic last week uh so i'm going to be not repeating the same things uh, there'll be a little bit of overlap. There's a link on the page right there. If you want to follow along with the topic, you can listen to the episode and see the graphics I'm about to post. Uh, but I'm going to start with the pyramid the, or the gearamid, as it were. So the gearamid is not my concept originally. Uh, this was posted in the Discord server by uh, one of our members when we were talking about, I don't even remember at this point, we were talking about when when is the right time to buy different kinds of equipment. And he posted up a pyramid, not this one, that came from Reddit, the guys at Quality Tactical Gear. And so I did some investigating, I looked into it, and there was a lot of things about it that seemed interesting if your priority was buying the coolest stuff as early as you could and fitting in and having armor and plates. But there was a lot of weird stuff, like your eye and ear pro was at the top level of the pyramid before, after you had already bought plates and everything. And that just seemed like it didn't make sense to me. And a little while later, somebody made an updated video called Gear Mid 2.0, which restructured a lot of those things and then also included training, which I thought was a much better step forward. I linked to both of those in the article uh, that I just flashed up on the screen, everydaymarksman.co forward slash gear. So it got me thinking about a different context. I'm not looking to go to war. I'm looking to teach somebody how to be a more prepared gun owner who's just more capable as a citizen and as a person. And this is what I thought up. And I shared it around with a few people, including my friend Justin at Swiss Island Deadly. I shared it around the Discord. Um, a lot of people have experience. And this is kind of what we settled on. And if this is hard to read right now, that's okay. I'm going to go through each level with a different graphic and walk you through it. But there's six levels here that we're going to focus on this evening. 
Um, the lowest level is your basic gear. This is more or less your everyday carry and your fundamentals. What do you? What is the absolute minimum for you just to be safe? All right, just be safe. The next level is patrol, and that is about uh, it. It is what I consider the main layer for most people who are going to get involved in anything from self defense to competitions to tactical training and learning how to use their gear. Like that's what you're going to need there, as well as just some basic other basic survival gear. The next level is sustainment. And we're gonna talk about why I broke out to sustainment versus going to the next level of fighting gear. Sustainment is about living more comfortably and building more so on your survival skills than it is your weapon skills. And then we get to scout. Now scout could be intelligence gathering, could be lots of things, but the point here is about observation. We're gonna talk about why that comes up. Then we get to the actual fighting gear, the fight layer. And this is where you start throwing on extra ammo and, and load carriage equipment. And then at the very top of the pyramid, we've got special. And I'll dig into what special means when we get there. So with that, let's set something up real quick because I think this is important to talk about. <clears throat> There's a lot that goes into being prepared and capable as a, as a citizen. There is, of course, owning the gun and knowing how to use the gun. But there's also things that are just going to keep you alive. And I think a lot of people focus on the gun and pew pew part of this more so than the things that are more likely to happen to them in an emergency. Now, me personally, I've been through several of those. I've, I've mentioned on streams before that I lived through Hurricane Andrew in 92, many hurricanes. Uh, when I lived in Miami, I hit by Katrina before I hit New Orleans. Then I got hit by Wilma right after, and we had power, didn't have power for several weeks. And, you know, then I lived in California with earthquakes and, and wildfires, lived in Montana with wildfires and blizzards that would knock out power for a couple of days, uh, or get stranded on the side of a highway when nobody's around. So I've seen some things and I had to learn to prepare for some things. And you are far more likely to need to know how to build a shelter, build a fire, purify water, do medical care for you or your loved ones just to survive, uh, to find food, to cook food. You're going to need to have to do all of that stuff more then you're going to have to know how to win a firefight. That's the bottom line. But because the firefight piece is so much fun, that's what we all focus on. So I want to make sure I get that out of the way first. Now let's get to the first layer, the basics. So this is your foundational kit and your EDC. Now YouTube's rules, I would love to hold up examples of some of the things we're talking about, but when it comes to weapons, can't touch them. That's YouTube's rules for a stream. So I'll just have to reference the ones on the back wall over there. Um, but where I can't show examples, I will. Don't take this to mean when I say something that this is the only option you have. It just happens to be what I own and what I have preferred. But there's lots of great options for these things out there. So number one, on a basic kit, you actually need a firearm. Uh, something reliable. That's number one. Don't worry about accuracy. Don't worry as much about how fast you can shoot it or how fancy it looks. Worry about it being reliable because the average shooter cannot shoot up to the capability of the rifle. Bottom line, you know, a lot of people will say going out there researching that, oh, I want the thing that's going to be a half MOA rifle uh, and then they're going to spend twice as much money as they had to to go buy that half MOA rifle and then they're going to feed it cheap surplus ammo and they themselves are like a 10 MOA shooter. They're not, they're not being served by a half MOA rifle. They're, they'd be better served by something extra reliable that they can learn to shoot well. All right, so reliable long arm and a reliable handgun. All right, I'd say both ideally. And the maintenance gear to take care of it. I think a lot of people shortchange this. They'll buy the rifle or the handgun, the pistol, and then they forget to buy cleaning kit. They forget to buy lube. Uh, they forget to buy uh, basic tools to help take care of that thing. You need all of that. It's all part of your basic stuff. All right, so the next you need a way to retain the weapon. So one example for handguns is holsters. So I've got a, a, got a one here. This is one of my companies is ANR Designs. Uh, this is one of my, actually my newest one I'm testing out with my PCR. And hey, this works well. I carry AIWB um, appendix, so that's my preference. Um, but you need a way to do retention. For a handgun, that means you need a holster because that's how you're gonna, that's how you're gonna carry the thing and keep it safe. Uh, I also have a leather one, experimenting with that. For a rifle, 
I didn't bring it. You need a sling. You need some way to sling it around your body so you can retain it when you have it. All right, so that's retention. You also need illumination. One example, um, you know, weapon lights are great. I have weapon lights in all my, my social use rifles. For handguns, I do both. I have one weapon mounted. I also don't mind just doing regular old flashlight. Uh, this works well, but you need illumination. Then you also need to think about optics or sighting equipment. So iron sights, I love iron sights. Go for it. If that's what you can afford, then run the iron sights. If you want to run to optics, go for optics, all right? Uh, everything works, but that's the minimum capable side of this thing. If your weapon needs retention, it needs illumination, and it needs some way to be accurate with your sight picture. First and foremost. All right, once you get past that, you get to magazines. I'm going to break tradition here a little bit because, and you can tell me if you think I'm wrong, but I'm going to break tradition here and say that I think you only need, at the beginning, you only really need three magazines per weapon. If you own one AR, that's what I'm going to lean with in this, this example here, you really only need three magazines to start. It's If it's a pistol, you only need three magazines to start. Why do I think that? Well, because I would rather you spend that money elsewhere. And when it comes to magazines, like I'm using an AR, you can put one in the gun and one in each of your pockets, your back pockets, your jeans, and that is fine. That will that will get you through for a while. You can take any basic fundamentals class using that, and it will work fine. Is it ideal? No, but I would rather you spend that money on getting training and practice. All right, so three magazines. Next, I have on here that you need some way to do water, hydration carrier. I prefer two ways to do this. One would be some kind of hydration bladder that goes in a backpack. Almost tons of backpacks out there have these these days. And, or, but I prefer both, a canteen or some kind of bottle to carry water. And I put in here that it should be metal. And this goes to what we're going to see in the next layer. This is a survival thing. When you have a metal, a single wall steel canteen, it means you can boil water in it. You can't do that with a plastic canteen. So you have to throw another way to purify or boil something. So steel works great. It doesn't even have to be a traditional canteen. There's some other really great products out there in the mountaineering community, um, like the Vargo Bot bottle pot that works really great for this stuff. All right, next, after your hydration, now we're talking about um, uh, what I got in here. All right, Robbie Emission, I said, you're going to need a medical kit, pocket size. What I got here, making a mess on my desk, this. So this is a Chinook Med bleeder kit. So yes, this is not quite pocket sized. I get that. Um, this goes in my backpack or my briefcase, whatever I carry to work, anywhere I go. This is just stuffed into one of the pockets on it. Um, and this has got all the basics I would need to cover trauma. So I've got a tourniquet in there. I've got a uh, quick clot, gauze, uh, gloves, um, pressure bandage. This is the basics. Uh, it's not that expensive. You can grab, grab a bunch of these things, toss one in, one in each of your cars. If you, if you have more than one car or one in the car, one in a backpack, stuff one in another part of the house, but need to have medical kits, especially ones designed to stop bleeding. And say so last on this is some kind of multi-tool or knife. So I've had this little skelly tool here, Leatherman skelly tool. I've had this for a long time. Um, a gift from my wife, shout out Allison. But this is a gift from my wife. This went on me with many nuclear alerts underground. Um, and I will neither confirm nor deny I may have done some unauthorized maintenance of broken gear while on alert using these things. It's just good to have a multi-tool. All right, so that's the, the weapon side of it. Now there's also a PPE side of this that I think everybody should start with. All right, and that is the stuff that you can you think of. It's the basics. You're gonna need good eye and ear protection. All right, so eye protection get something ballistic all right ballistic rated that is designed for abuse all right don't get your cheap like 399 plastic junk from walmart or the science section that you maybe have used to like when you were in high school chemistry class get real real stuff from companies that meet the spec a lot of great ones out there um, my go-to right now are revision i'm looking at like smith optics uh, but there's a bunch of companies out there that do great stuff if you need prescription and i'm not wearing wearing my glasses right now, which is making it a little bit harder to read this. If you have a prescription, I have astigmatism, get the RX lenses, get the prescription lenses. It's going to help you a lot. All right. So then you need to worry about your ear pro. I actually double layer ear pro. So if you are a beginner and you're not used to firearms, they're allowed. 
do double ear pro. All right, so little foamies on the inside and then electronics on the outside. Uh, if you're going to a 22 match, like a rimfire match, you don't, probably don't need the outer electronic ear protection. It's fine. Foamies will work great. If you're going to be in an indoor range, like I typically shoot at, it's nice to be able to double up. Hearing is one of those things that people underestimate until it's gone. If you abuse your hearing, you will lose it and you don't get it back. Enough said about that. All right. Um, you need... Let's see what I got in here. Gloves. Any kind of glove will do. Here's my preferred brand. These are uh, Skitty Tactical Pigs. Um, pig Alphas. These work great, but these are what you need to protect yourself from abrasion. If you're out doing something you know, with your rifle, there's some sharp edges or debris on the ground or heat. Rifles get hot, especially with these nice fancy metal free float tubes. They get hot and you will burn yourself. Uh, it's also good for just keeping traction. Your hands get sweaty, dirty, bloody. You know, things get slick. So it's good to have gloves, just as basic PPE. All right, the last things I have on there is you need to have durable clothing. Uh, like, you know, think outdoors here. I'm not saying you need to go buy uniform gear, but something that can put up with abuse. Don't don't think you're going to get by with just like wearing your cheap cargo shorts and pair of flip-flops. Buy, buy some quality clothing to put up with your training schedule. And with that, foul weather gear. People underestimate how much it sucks to be out in the rain, in the cold, and, and trying to do training or living. All right, get good rain gear. A poncho will do fine. It's actually a nice multi-use item. So that is the basic layer. Good point. So um, thank you, Echo 7 Foxtrot. Good to see you. Uh, yeah, bring spares, um, spare batteries. Uh, and look, Electronic Ear Pro is not that expensive. It is, in fact, something that it it, it like you can get a pretty decent set. Howard Lights are not very expensive. I'm not saying you need to go out and buy a pair of like MSA Sordans or Auto Norse Barriers or you know Comtax for six seven hundred dollars. Like you don't need that to get started. You can you can start pretty cheap on this stuff. All right, let's go to the next layer here. So that's the basics. That is that is that is enough to get started. That is your fundamentals in EDC. And actually, before I go to the next layer, let's talk about training. Because this is this is where rubber meets the road. Just because you own the gear doesn't mean you're ready for the you're ready. You have to get trained how to use it. So in the article, uh, again, I'm gonna post up the link on here. So in the article, I did mention some training at every level. You know, at the basic level. What we're talking about is basic marksmanship fundamentals. So the ones I suggest the most is some kind of basic firearm safety course. NRA certified is fine, or really anybody qualified to teach it. Almost any good gun owner will be able to teach this to you, but there are many who shouldn't. So seek out somebody who's actually qualified to do it. Almost any range has somebody on staff who can do this for you. Next, Project Appleseed. This is your probably some of the best marksmanship fundamentals training I've ever got to participate in. So it is a fantastic course, and you can do it with a 22. I did it with with a 20 inch government profile barrel AR and a whole lot of 223. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, I made some other people at the range who were at the session kind of annoyed because I was throwing a lot of hot brass at them. But Appleseed is a fantastic marksmanship fundamentals program. And yes, I know I'm talking about rifle in that case, but the fundamentals of marksmanship don't change between rifle and pistol. If you watched a few weeks ago with Josh Shaw, we made a big deal out of uh, saying that. So learn the fundamentals. Next, you want to take a first aid class. So I just held up a first aid kit. First aid kit is great, but if you own it and you don't know how to use it, you're still going to have a problem. So something like Stop the Bleed is a great course. Uh, I have links to all these things again in this article. So you can go to the website. I've got links to where to go do these courses. Stop the Bleed is a great program for doing this. Now that would say as, as a minimum. I do think that someone who's at this basic fundamentals level should be thinking about, you know, some kind of defensive training, whether it's defensive carbine, defensive handgun, and concealed carry. But now we're getting into a next level of things beyond just what you can stuff into your pockets. Get more comments coming in. All right, two is one and one is none. Yes, and I actually want to mention this here in a second, David. Thank you for bringing that up. And... Just subscribe. Great. Oh, well, thank you for subscribing. I really do appreciate that. All right. So let's get on to the next layer here. So we've gone from the fundamentals in EDC. What would I say is the next thing that a gun owner who is looking to be responsible should worry about? So this gets us to what I call the patrol level. 
Now we went in the Discord chat, we went through a lot of iterations of what do we call this? And we started with patrol, we went through training and competition and then all over and then back to patrol. So what is this layer? This is the layer where you take, you build on your fundamentals of, you know, you know basics of marksmanship, you know safe handling, a little bit of basic defensive tactics, first aid, and you build on that. And you get a little bit more serious about how you're carrying your stuff. So the first thing I start off on here with is at a basic level, I said you should have three magazines per weapon, three for your rifle, three for your handgun. At patrol level, you need a good way to carry that. So pouches, you know, one to two rifle mag pouches, one to two pistol mag pouches. Um, again, I'm not picky about which one you do here. Everybody's got a personal preference. Um, I've used a lot of rifle mag pouches over the years, and th they all do their job just fine. Now, on my battle belt back there, um, if you've read my articles on that one, that one currently has two HSGI tacos on it. Uh, for my rifle mags, I did that because I tend to shoot a lot of different rifles and it's nice to be able to go between. It does have short falls though. Uh, and I also have two Tactical Taylor Magna pistol mag pouches, which again, I like because I can stuff almost anything in them and the magnet in there will, will hold to it. All right, so you need a way to carry your magazines. You also need um, a belt-mounted holster. So earlier I mentioned, you know, your... EDC holster. If you're if you're going to carry, then you need an EDC style holster. This one is for concealment. When you're going to the battle belt, you're probably going something that's outside the waistband. Uh, I don't have it up here with me, and I don't want to pull down the battle belt to do it to show you. But something like a you know neck, just outside the waistband, blade tech, open top retention. I'm not, not picky about that, but you need something that's sturdy, and you need the belt that's going to be able to hold it. You also need your first aid kit. So again, earlier I said you should have something like this that can fit into a pocket or stuff it in your car or backpack. Now I'm talking about one that goes onto your belt. So that way it's always accessible by you or someone else who's working with you. It's right there and it's obvious. Now in military context, I know, I believe it's the Brits. They like to not put the medical kit on their belt, but they do standardize it. Something like this would go into their left cargo pocket. Makes sense if that if you have a fighting unit that you work with and everybody knows that's procedure. Not everybody's gonna have that. All right, so keep that in mind. If you have to work with other people, make it obvious for them. All right, so beyond the belt, um, the battle belt itself. I have a very long article about this. In fact, it's one of the most popular articles on the website. The bottom line here is, I'm again, I'm not picky about, is this a full-on molly belt that wraps around all of your clothing? That's what I've got. It's what I use. Or is this like the inner outer Velcro liner belt around your pants and then the one that sticks to it? They, they both do their job just fine. The goal, though, is you want to keep this fairly low profile. Don't load down your battle belt with a ton of gear. Uh, don't make it super high profile. When I say high profile, I don't mean like, like, wow, look at that. I mean, it's a lot of bulk. Because if you're going to throw this on in an emergency, like you've got patrols going on in your neighborhood at a natural disaster or whatever, sometimes you want discretion and you want something that would fit under a jacket. Right. And if you have this very big, bulky belt that's very hard to hide, that's not going to help you out. All right. So, something that can go either or, it always works well. If you were going to ask me, uh, why do I use the full on Molly belt? Well, the answer is because when I got into doing this stuff, which was over 10 years ago, that was what was hot on the market. And I, I have never felt the need to significantly upgrade from that. And in fact, uh, when I do a lot of stuff in like the fall and spring and, and winter, I tend to wear heavier layers on the outside and it's nice to have a belt that goes around everything. I don't have to worry about mounting it to my pants belt and then it's hard to get to under my jacket. So it's just my personal preference. All right, so outside the battle belt, what else do we need here? We're getting into some other interesting stuff. Um, uh, fixed blade knife. I don't quite know YouTube's rules on blades. I know I can't touch firearms. And I'm not gonna risk it with blades, but a fixed blade knife is important specifically a bushcraft oriented knife, not a fighting knife, because when it comes to what you're going to be actually doing in an emergency or in disaster, you're going to need the tool and knives are invaluable tools. Um, yes, knives can always cut and stab. You don't need a, you know, a, a double edged or spear point fighting knife. They look badass. All right. They look badass, but you don't need that. What you need is a knife you can trust on, rely on for cutting wood, 
making wood shavings, carving, or just cutting stuff in the environment. All right, so some kind of fixed blade knife, figure four to five inches, like the SE4, SE5s are great. I have a Becker BK16, but there's nothing wrong with Mora. Mora knife, I, specifically the Mora Garberg, because it's a full tang, not a rat tail. Again, my personal preference. All right, you're gonna need land navigation gear. All right, when I say land nav, GPS is fantastic. But please take this from somebody who used to be a space officer for the Air Force. And I know a lot about how satellites work, all right? GPS is a fantastic tool, but it is not a perfect tool. And the government retains the ability to turn it off for you at any time they wish, all right? Um, without going into the details of how all that works, it's not classified, it's just complicated. Uh, the government can turn off GPS, all right, for everybody but themselves. They have not done that uh, since the 90s, uh, but they can do it. Uh, on top of that, GPS is satellite-based, and it uses radio signals. Radios can be jammed. Satellites can be shot down if we're talking worst-case scenario. All that to say, GPS is great. You should, you should definitely have a GPS unit, but you need to learn some old-school land nav. For that, I'm going to be right back. Why not? So this is my land nav kit. So you can get all kinds of fancy tools. You need a compass. I didn't grab my compass. Um, some kind of compass. You need a little protractor and a measuring tool so you can learn MGRS and grid grids. Um, Essie, who makes the knives, also has these really handy little cards, which are going to be really hard to see on camera. These little transport cards you can lay over your maps. Uh, and help you do measuring and plot plot things out. You need to have you need to learn how to use this stuff. Again, owning it is not the same as being proficient at its use. And the time to learn how to do this stuff is when before bad things happen. So look out there for getting some good land nav gear. You can get topographic maps from National Geographic, from mytopo.com. Lots of places you can get it from the government. Get some topographic maps. Get some training on how to use it. How to how to not just plot a i need to go a direction but also think about pace count without gps how do you know how far you've gone so learn your pace count how do you do dead reckoning how do you do terrain association so again some classes i have suggested at this level is um land nav uh, there's a lot of places that do the land nav especially um I, I, there's a lot of them I don't, I don't need to go through that you can find land nav courses uh, i also mentioned in here that you need to be looking at signaling now signal Specifically in this case, I'm thinking within eye and ear hearing range. All right, so think whistles, think hand signals, think high visibility panels, not radio. Trust me, I love me some radio, um, but this is this comes later. All right, I think there's a lot to be gained from learning basic communication skills using more primitive techniques because uh, that's going to teach you good habits. But signal, so again, you can learn signal stuff. Uh, and then you also need ways to make fire. So what do I mean by fire? And this is where what David comments about two is one and one is none comes in. Thinking about land nav, you can more like GPS and compass and map. Fire, you can think lighter and here's a cheap ferro rod. This one also has a whistle on it, All right, This it doesn't look like much, but this works. If you know what you're doing and you also get like little paraffin cubes you can make, take some cotton balls, soak them in Vaseline and stuff them into a container and they'll, they'll light right up with a spark. Um, I do suggest though, rather than little small, that, that one's a light my fire one, Swedish steel, get a larger one. Um, this will last a lot longer. This produces a much better spark. And here I am gonna try to do this live on stream. It's probably not gonna work right. Yeah, go figure, All right? Yeah. All right, I look like an idiot. Moving on. Need two ways to make fire. You know, I practiced that to make sure it was not going to do that to me before the stream started, and it did it anyway. Go me. All right, so that's uh, what we need out of that. Now, training. I mentioned land nav. I mentioned some signal training. Uh, you also need, uh, where have we got in here? Survi so that's survival training where they're going to teach you how to things like build shelters, identify plants, purify water, uh, 
Then you get into, this is optional, but I think it's a patrol layer. You've got the gear to start doing some more serious training and competition. So this is where you could go do something like a small unit tactics class. You could get involved in doing, um, you know, action shooting or marksmanship. They're all really good options. Uh, but I think it's really important to start actually putting your skills to use. Now, if you want to go do something like, I'll throw out Max Velocity Tactical, um, his Heat 1 Combat combat Tactics course, it's fantastic. Um, uh, I've done that one. It's great. I will admit that you need a little bit more gear than what I'm saying is appropriate at the patrol layer, so that's fine. Just deal with it when you get there. Um, but great course, and you're going to learn a lot from doing that. Uh, the important thing at the patrol layer to me I'll bring that one back up. The important thing to keep to, to note here is that for the average person, you could stay at this level forever. Like if you've done the training and you have done and you're staying practice and you've got just a minimal amount of gear, we're talking a battle belt that can carry two rifle mags and two pistol mags and a holster and first aid kit. 90% of the time you will be just fine. If you have five people in your community who have that, who have that and the training to use it, 90% of the time, going to be great. More than good enough, you can now focus on other things. All right, so this is a really comfortable place to be. Now, that said, there are limitations to this. Number one was three, three magazines total. One, the gun, two, uh, two on the belt. 90 rounds is a really good number. There are very few situations I can think of where 90 rounds per person is not enough to break contact and run away, which should be the priority not getting into a pitched firefight. So uh, before I go on to the next layer here, let's see what some of the comments are at. Beware of the tactical yard sale. Yeah, tactical yard sale. If I'm thinking uh, what you're thinking about this, this is people who just drop their stuff everywhere in the field. So we don't want that. Oh, there it is. Stuff strewn about, yes. Don't be a yard sale. Lids are wonderful things. Assume this means we're talking about hats and helmets. We'll get to that. On knives, go go ham and get an adventurous sworn bushcrafting knife. <laughs> so this is talking about a dual a dual combo. Um, I do agree. Get a good blade. Now, adventurous sworn, they're beautiful blades. I, I will admit, if I had an adventurous sworn blade. I would probably be afraid to take it to the field for fear of marring it up, which is what it's supposed to do. But I'm, I know my personality that I would, if I spent that much on a blade, I probably would not use it when I know my Beckers and, and Moras can do what I need them to do. <laughs> I like nice things. Yes, yes, me too. Uh, hey, PPU Archives, welcome. Yep, missed the first 30 minutes. You're out there watching Ukraine collapse, right? Yeah, so this is a really great point um, when it comes to bushcraft knives. Um, you can tell someone's done some training with bushcraft. So with a 90 degree spine, I'm going to break out my failed attempt at a ferro rod here. Uh, so this comes with this little like thing that hangs off the side. But what a lot of really, you know, people who are experienced will look for, like the Mora Garberg I mentioned, the Mora Garberg Carbon back edge of the knife will be sharp 90 degree angles so it works with one of these rods just flip the knife over and you can spark it and you can get a get a pretty good spark out of it that way it's a really handy way to, again to have multiple purpose things and it looks like we got somebody posting some porn in the chat and blocked all right lids help avoid this oh you're all right i get what you're saying dice man so lids on your pouches so covered pouches um, you know, this is a funny thing because, you know, I'm just going to turn chat on the screen here. Let's do that. There we go. We're going to run the chat on the screen. <clears throat> yeah. So the funny thing about lids is the trend for so long has been about open top, super fast, um, but if you listen to the podcast I did with Mike Green talking about tactical games, at some point you will end up upside down <laughs> and you will lose your stuff. So um, it makes sense to have things that are really important, get covered and dummy corded when possible. So great. The Garberg is a great recommendation. Thank you. Yeah, I'm a big fan of that one. Um, the Garberg Carbon. All right, let's go on to the next layer, sustainment. So I know one of the questions I'm going to get about this on the sustain layer 
is <clears throat> oh I want to see a comment there from Pew Pew. See now 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 this is why I didn't have it on the screen. I'm gonna I'm gonna get you know a train of thought interrupted. I'm gonna come back to that one. All right. All right, sustain. We're not looking to up our profile even further with fighting fighting gear. What we actually want to do is be able to survive better in the field. So the first thing I recommend here is a small assault pack. When I say small, I mean something in the 15 to 20 liters size. That's that's small. Um, it is not a lot of room. It's basically an oversized general purpose pouch. So you know, one of my favorites, my personal one that I use the most is right there. And it's still loaded down with my range gear, but it's this. So this is uh, Savota Jakari S, Jakari Small. This is about 20 liters. Um, I also have a Hill People Gear Terahimara, even smaller that I like. But you want to keep it small because you don't want to overload it. You don't want to be able to stuff so much stuff into it that it, that it weighs you down. Uh, so here's a way to think about this. I didn't. I mentioned this in the article uh, and uh, in the podcast, but in the military, the way things will typically work is you've got your first line, second line, third line. Your first line is what's typically in your pockets and on your belt. That's what your survival gear is going to be. Go back to the fundamentals in EDC and maybe your fire starting gear, a little bit of medical. Your second line is your fighting kit. So that's, again, your magazines, uh, your holsters, frags. We don't have frags for civilians. All that fun party gear for when the party starts. Uh, your third line is your rucksack, and that's your survival gear that you will live and survive out of. Now, in the military, if you're approaching a fight, let's say you're fully got all your gear on, weighs about 80 pounds or more, probably more. As you get closer to the fight, you're going to drop your ruck. All right, so you're going to drop probably a good 40 pounds right there, and then you go fight, and then you come back and pick up your ruck, and then you move on your way. The point of the assault pack, in this case, the 15 to 20 liters, is it stays with you, which means you need to keep it light enough that it's not going to hinder you moving around a lot. So you're trying to keep it pretty minimal. So what goes in this in this rucksack? I do believe uh, Pew Pew asked that question just now. So to me, what goes in my assault pack? Number one is water. All right. So this is a great place to put your hydration bladder, uh, an extra canteen and water purification kit. This is where I'm going to stick an emergency shelter kit. And when I say emergency shelter, it is not complicated. I mean, we're talking like a rain poncho or a small tarp and some bungee cords, something I can stake into the ground, tie to a tree and just get under to get out of the rain or out of the weather or just cover myself up from observation. All right. I'm going to be thinking about 24 hours or so of food to two broken down MREs. Uh, I believe Garen Thumb talked about this in his recce videos, you know, tortillas and peanut butter are a great way to, to pack some calories in the field without taking a whole lot of space and they don't get crushed very easy is it super tasty yeah but is it you know super nutritious no it'll give you some calories though uh now you can go up to before we get to that extra medical supplies so again your trauma kits like this are great for stopping a bleed stopping if you get it if you get all right let's say let's you get shot obviously but let's say you you get cut by something in the field um, you're walking along and you get poked by a branch or a metal shard that was poking up and, and you you cut something and you need to stop the bleeding. Great. But what about scratches and bumps? What about painkillers? What about band-aids? You know, a lot of those like chap, oh, chapstick, sunblock, a lot of that kind of stuff people forget when they're thinking worst case scenario, but there's a lot of other things that can happen medically. So throw those extra medical items in your, in your assault pack. All right. Now I did say on here that you can go up to a larger pack like i'm thinking that 30 liter 30 to 45 liters but that's more of a three-day style i don't think that's what most people are going to be needing at this point now also on here i say uh, this is where you add extra ammo so at the basic layer i mentioned three magazines per weapon and i kept it i kept that at the patrol layer where you went still three magazines per weapon but now you have a way to carry it at the sustainment layer you should own six magazines per weapon. Still carry three with you, one in the gun, two on the belt, and three more in the pack. All right, so I mentioned 90 rounds is enough to break contact and get away. It is. And then wherever you get away to, 
you can restock yourself on the magazines. All right. So we're talking about surviving. Um, this is not about a pitched firefight. All right. Now let's talk about training at this level. So training at the sustainment level doesn't actually do a whole lot of new stuff because again, we want to keep refining what we've already done. So I would say is anything you had skipped by this point to include that small unit tactics class is a great thing to go back and do. Uh, now I'm going to throw a shout out here. I've had Doc Larson and Brent 0331 on the stream a couple times. So they both, and Doc runs one shepherd and, and both uh, Brent and Les, who was on the last time, uh, our instructors do a do cadre for it. One Shepherd is a fantastic program. You know, I've talked with them a lot, read into it, and there's three courses I think that our prepared gun owner would benefit from. One is their warrior basic course. There's their land navigation course, building on those land nav skills, and their warrior advanced course. This is going to be your exposure to really working alongside a team, doing these things we're talking about within the context of a broader operation. So you get this context of not just individual skills, but logistics and team skills. And then also you get a preview of the next layer up or the next few layers up where we get into more complicated skills like radio. So I'll stop there. Let's check, let's check how the comments are doing. All right. Do you have a list of essential gear to have in your 18 liter salt pack on the website? Uh, yes, I do. So I know I just mentioned it here in the stream, Pew Pew, but I actually have an article about assault packs and I did uh, put a gear list a gear list on there uh, as far as um, what could go into assault pack. It's a lot of what I just mentioned, including a few other things like your weapon weapons maintenance gear, um, like a cleaning kit for your rifle, that kind of stuff is all really good to have in the field. Um, I don't have a link immediately offhand, but if you just search everyday marksman assault pack, it'll, it'll pop up. All right. So uh, trying, trying the idea of a butt pack and an 18 liter pack on the shoulders. This is a great idea, but we're actually going to come back to this one. I think combining a light pack with a full LBE harness with a butt pack is a very functional way to do it. My only trade-off here is that so far in our progression, we have not reached the LBE. We're still talking about simple battle belts, so, so this isn't an option yet. But it's a very viable option, all right, where you can keep some super essentials in the butt pack. We're going to talk about this in a second. Actually, screw it. We'll talk about it now. So my friend Justin, I mentioned from Swift Silent Deadly, He's a former um, Marine, or he's a Marine Marsoc. Uh, he was a Raider, but he did a lot of recon stuff. And I know Recky's super popular right now, but he has he put an article this week, great article, and he talked about this a little bit. And I thought it was really insightful when he talked about the food and the water aspect. So let's say you've got your butt pack. Your butt pack can have some rations in it. I mentioned that 24 hours. So yeah, you can keep 24 hours of stuff in there and you maybe got some water on your on your belt as well. From his training, he would also have a ruck. The stuff that's on your belt and your butt packing on your belt, that is your absolute last resort. Do not consume this until you are out of everything else and you need it. Otherwise, eat, eat the extra food and water that was in your pack first. Because then if you ditch the pack and you're without it for a while, you still have what was in your belt as your, as your emergency backup. So always save what was in your belt for last. And that's a good example of dividing up what was in your pack versus what goes into your belt. And how do you think about that? Okay. Um, yeah. If you, injury is obviously going to be something you have to contend with along the way. Six mags and the rest on strippers for lightweight. So this is a great example. This is a fantastic way to do things. Um, if you carry six mags and however you want to do it, whether it's like three on the belt, three in the pack or six on a gear, we're going to get to that at the fight layer. Um, that's great. If you want, if you want extra ammo, stripper clips are the stripper clips are amazing. Those little speed loaders, you just throw the clip and zip. The only caveat to this one, uh, from my experience, and granted, I am not a ground pounder. I'm not an infantry guy. I'm just someone who's done a lot of training competition, is if you have used your mags and failed to retain them, this gets harder. So it's something to keep in mind. Retain your magazines when appropriate. I know if you, if you, go, to, if you go to Max Velocity Tactical School and you try and keep your mags on you in the middle of the exercise, I'm not going to say you're going to get a rock to the back of the head, but you're going to get yelled at. <laughs> so... Leave your mags on the ground until the firefight's done. Then you can go back and retrieve your mags, but you do need to retrieve your mags. Hey, Danny. Welcome. 
And yes, you heard radio. So we're about to talk about that. Um, and extra batteries. Yes, extra batteries are are absolutely important to have in the pack if you need if you need them. If you have something that requires batteries, which frankly you probably do between illumination and other stuff that we're carrying. All right, so let's go to the next layer here. We're going up. We went to the sustain. Now we're getting up to scout. So one of the questions that is going to come up here is why did I put scouting in front of a fight? Well, there's a reason for this, is that we're not a military unit. We're not advancing to contact. We're not looking for a fight. In fact, our purpose is to avoid the fight. So to me, what's more important for our average prepared citizen is to have better equipment for recognizing threats before they see you and then avoiding the fight altogether. So. The scout layer is actually pretty thin on equipment, but it's stuff that I think is important. So for instance, a good pair of binoculars, um, invaluable, or a spotting scope, really great stuff to have. Um, I also think this is where you get into radio. So line of sight radio. So if you guys are radio nerds like Denny and I, uh, line of sight means we're dealing with VHF and UHF. Um, good for several miles, all right? Good for several miles. Um, pretty much good for dealing inside your team or even inside your community. If there's a repeater nearby, you get even further than that. But we're dealing with line of sight radio. Now, the caveat is that line of sight radio comes with a separate skill set that you have to learn and practice. It's not meant for just general chit chat. All right. Um, now, we're also getting into scout layer. So, this is where we get to additional tools. So, let's say you go from your classic bushcraft knife, like the Mora Garberg or the Adventure Sworn. Now, you're talking about things like axes, you're talking about shovels, you're talking, you know, saws, um, machetes. And the reason I'm saying you're getting to this is because now you're going to be potentially creating hides, defensive positions. You're going to be digging into the ground and constructing hides and places to hunker down. Uh, and hide yourself, you know, literally. So you want the tools to be able to do that for yourself. Now, I also mentioned here that this is where you get yourself up to 10 magazines per weapon. So this is uh, for the average person where I suggest they should be, is look look to own 10 magazines per weapon you've got. Even if you're only going to carry six at a time, it's nice to have those spares in case you've left one in the field. Now, when it comes to the scout layer, what do I think is the appropriate training that we want for a person who's got this level of gear you know they've gone through all of this small unit tactics they've gone through uh combat combat training defensive training they've done a lot of great stuff by this point so now we're starting to branch out and at the scout layer i think one person's probably not gonna be able to do all of this you're now looking at who who in your group if you have a group and hopefully you do um who is going to start specializing in things so stuff that i think is really important to do here number one is get your amateur radio technician license all right you need to get the license because you need to practice um, while nothing is going to stop you from buying your radio without a license and just turning on and using it um, nothing will stop you from doing that except the other amateur radio users who don't take kindly to that because it's technically illegal and they could try and direction find you and report you to the FCC and then you end up with a lot of fines and fees and it's just, you get the license it's 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 not difficult to get uh, and that way you open yourself up to be able to practice you know freely you just announce your call sign do what you're going to do experiment with antennas do all kinds of stuff um, so get your license get the technician license that's what gets you line of sight then go to start doing some training all right, the license is not good training. It's just, do you know the rules and the basics of electronics? So things like uh, Brush Beater. So he has a fantastic RTO basic course. It goes through all of how to do things like signal operating instructions. How do I you know, improvise antennas? How do I set myself up for success with communications? He also has a great scout and recce course, a recon course where you're gonna do the things I'm talking about. How do you construct a hide? How do you make notes about what's going on in your environment so that you have that early warning capability? Uh, Max Velocity Tactical also has one of those as well, so shout out to them. Um, I don't think you need to do both. Um, pick one or the other, but they're both going to be good options for you. All right, now I start looking at advanced medical training. So like the Wilderness, uh, Wilderness Medical Association has advanced training, especially out in the woods. How are you going to deal with that? How do you deal with broken bones? How do you do a lot more, I'm not going to say emergency medicine, like an EMT, that's safe for later, but how do you better take care of yourself? 
I also think there's room here for doing advanced lab nat, land navigation because you're going to need a refresher. And yes, I know a lot of the training I'm saying has a lot of overlap, like land nav here, land nav there. Uh, my profession, now that I'm no longer in the military, my profession is as an instructor, uh, adult education. And it's really important to not just learn it once and then never touch it again. You need to see it over and over again and practice it and be reminded of it and see different ways to do it. That's how you're going to get it really ingrained into your mind of how something works and how you're going to keep doing it into the future. All right, let's see where we're at in some of these comments. So we talk about extra batteries. All right, Denny, what are your thoughts on IFAC at six, six o'clock on the belt? All right. Um, this is this is interesting. All right. So we, what Denny means here is what are my thoughts on putting your first aid kit on your belt at the small of your back? I think it's a great option if you have the right first aid kit. So for instance, my first aid kits, I've got one on my belt back here. All of my all of my kits have them. Right now, they are all located at my four o'clock. So on my right side, right behind where my holster is or would be if I was using something without a holster on it. I actually would like to, on my battle belt, get that to six o'clock with the caveat that that pouch needs to be one like a SO tech Viper flat, flat one where it's low profile and flat so you can sit into a chair or in a vehicle and it's not going to smash into your back. And it actually has pull on each side where you can tug it one direction or the other and it pulls out like an inner sleeve pulls out and then you can grab it. So that's the only reason I would go with a six. Otherwise, you want it within reach of both arms um, and you and you can see what's going on or someone else is able to reach into it and see what's going on. So this gets into a whole lot of separate world. I, I would love to have this conversation about first aid setup, But again, it's a very um, it's a very unit specific thing like how you pack your first aid kit should be the same amongst everybody on the team so that you can grab anybody's first aid kit and know exactly where things are um, so that's important step all right dice no e-tool scout i did mention digging and cutting equipment so e-tool counts as digging and cutting harumph Up your land nav game, do it at night and under NVD. See, you're jumping ahead, Dice, because we're not talking about night vision until we get to the very top of the pyramid. So you can't do it yet. Um, but yes, yes, you. Uh, it, this is this is an important. This is a skill. If you're going to go into the night vision game, same kind of deal. Don't think you're going to buy the equipment and then never have to touch it until it's time to use it at night because it's it's different. <laughs> it's it's you. Will, there's some learning curve there. Yeah, pouch within the pouch. So I, I don't have the Viper one. I do have on my 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 comp like my lower profile competition belt. I have an article in it called the Tactical Belt. I have one from HSGI that's uh, similar. It's just really thin, about about that big, and it has a pull tab on each side that I can yank out. Um, I actually take that one to the range with me all the time because it's public range, and I don't trust people. Yeah, T Rex Arms by Pouch. I have no experience with that one, but no no reason to doubt it. Fanny Pack IFAC has been great for all around usage. Yeah. Um, so I don't have a trip fanny pack one. I do have uh the Esotech Mission Go bag, A1. I, it's actually my road bag and use it for photography uh when I'm out out and about because I can carry things like spare lenses uh and you know extra extra batteries and, and, and memory cards it used to be my tactical diaper bag for my son. Um, that's a great way to carry a bunch of stuff. It was originally designed to be a medical bag. Yeah, this is, so the commonality thing is huge. Um, you see this come up in a lot of, of SOPs. All right, one more here. We got vouch the Viper to get set up. Yeah. So yeah, I think he has a, he has two versions now at SO tech. So there's the Viper a one, and there's the Viper uh, LE for like law enforcement. That's a little smaller, and honestly, that's probably the way I would go, just to keep it lighter and a little bit lower profile for fitting under stuff. All right, let's get to the next layer here. So we've gone up from our basics in EDC, our fundamentals. We've gone to our patrol layer, which is fine for 90% of people. Our sustainment layer, where we throw on a pack with some extra gear to make our life a little more comfortable uh, and a little bit extra ammo. And our scout layer, which is about intelligence gathering and understanding what's coming and 
uh, communicating, better communication. Now, assuming everything else has gone wrong, we're at the fight layer. So when we get to the fight layer, now it's about winning the firefight. Now I am full of caveat here and you know I'm I'm not someone who's going to tell you how to win the firefight, not my profession. I am an enthusiast who's done a bunch of training and I've read some stuff um, and competition. So I, I have been advised by many people who have been in this situation winning firefights that this is the right track. So full transparency there. Um, but this is where you start doing things like adding a chest rig um, or, or a load bearing harness. So it's one or the other in this case. For most people, if you're trying to be conscious of your budget because thus far has been fairly fairly expensive the chest rig is the way to go and i say that because if you already own the battle belt that you've been training and practicing with and you've been using it for everything so far and that carries two rifle mags two pistol mags a first aid kit a holster you know maybe some water then when you throw the chest rig on a minimalist chest rig at that you know figure one that has four mags across the chest and not a whole lot else you know, you're just plussing yourself up and that's pretty low profile. All right. Now you've got six mags on your body, potentially four more in your pack. If you've got 10 mags per, per weapon, um, you're pretty good, pretty well set. And that's a very easy way to do it. And the chest rig can also stand alone. Let's say you've got the chest rig, uh, but no belt. Hey, you still got the rifle and four on the chest. All right. Um, so that's the easier way to go. You can combine it with what you already own. If you want to go a little, little heavier, or if you live in a really hot, humid place like South Florida, I think I got a comment uh, on the blog today about that one, or even on, I think it was actually on YouTube today about that, another discussion, or you live just in general where it's really hot, you're exerting yourself, load bearing equipment, like old school Alice style gear, great way to deal with this because that's all around your belt. You've got suspenders, so it's not terribly low profile, um, but you've got everything you need all around your waist and you don't necessarily even need the assault pack at that point. If you've got the butt pack with your emergency stuff for 24 hours, you've got water, you've got ammo, you've got first aid, you got land, like it all fits right on your body uh, and it's really convenient to uh, deal with it. It's just going from a battle belt to now doing a, a, a whole low bearing harness, that's a, that's a lot of redundancy that's also really expensive to do well. Not that Alice can't do it well, but I'm thinking things like Velocity Systems, Jungle Gear, um, First Spear, Patrolling Harness, British, uh, British Webbing Kit, which is amazing. But you're going to spend a lot of money to do that when it's a lot cheaper just to get a good chest rig and layer it with your battle belt. No, I do both. I have, multi I have multiple sets of doing all this because I'm stupid and I spent a lot of money on things. I justify it to myself by saying someday I can equip my neighbors to be my fire team. There we go. That's where my head is at. Um, all right. <laughs> so let's, let's step aside from the fighting gear. If you haven't done this yet, and I think this, this frankly, go a lot of this goes into your maintenance equipment. I put down the basic level. But if you haven't been doing this yet, then you need to be buying spare parts because assuming you've done all the training and competitions, you're probably coming up close to, to stuff being breaking on your, on your equipment, your rifle especially. You want spare parts. You want spare springs. I'd say you want a complete spare bolt carrier group, not just a spare bolt, you know, the complete bolt carrier group. So this was a piece of advice I got from instructor once, um, Scott, kudos, shout out to Scott. Um, he he was a, he's a, was a first sergeant in a army long range reconnaissance patrol, patrol unit. And he, he mentioned this to me and he said, the reason he recommends the complete bolt carrier group is that if you are in the field, and your bolt breaks, you shear a lug, something goes wrong. Um, you know, hopefully that doesn't happen in the midst of a firefight, but you know, worst case scenario, it does, and you need to get your rifle back in the game. You do not want to be sitting there, field stripping your rifle, ripping the takedown pins out or the retainer pins from the bolt carrier, uh, fishing that little thing out while you're being shot at. Uh, you want to be able to rip out the bolt carrier group grab a fresh one that's fully intact, drop it in the rifle, slap it, close the pins, and get back in the fight. All right, that's what you want to be able to do. And his suggestion was complete bolt carrier group. And then if you can find like a classic aeronautical flare tube, they're about just about that size and they're waterproof, perfect fit for bolt carrier group. Slides right into the tube and you're good to go. All right. So you want spare parts. Training. 
let's talk about training at the fight layer. Uh, this is where I think it gets important to start looking at force on force. You've seen a little bit of it so far because if you've done the one shepherd schools, that's all force on force. But now I'm looking at things like, uh, again, MVT. I go back to them because I don't know of many other schools in the country who are teaching small unit tactics and doing force on force like this. I know there's there's MVT. Um, Green Eyes Tactical, I think, is another one. I think they're out in Texas. Um, one Shepherd. But that's about it. That's about it, guys. There's not people teaching this stuff. And this is, it's a different world when you actually start doing this with other people, right? So MVT has their combat patrol. Uh, it has They have their squad tactics. Uh, one Shepherd has the light leaders course, as well as a full-on um, seminar called STX and, and field training simulation. All these are force on force. You're going to put all of your gear to the test and learn Take everything you've learned so far about land navigation, planning, communication, um, small unit tactics, and you're going to put it to use and see how it goes. Now, let's see where we're at with the comments before I get to the last level of this pyramid. LB chest rigs have to be balanced. Yes. Um, Oh, I would say I wouldn't, I would probably not put an LB. I probably would not combine an LBE with a chest rig, to be honest. I think that's, that's too many straps going around. Now, one of the things you'll notice I did not mention here was plate carriers. You know, yes, a plate carrier technically can be used as a chest rig, take the plate out. I think that looks sloppy and I would rather be, do it differently. And then plates is actually going to come in the next layer here. So, yeah. Um, you know, this is a funny, this is a funny thing about this is that I have a habit of this is that spare rifles, spare rifle parts tend to become spare rifles. So if I have an unused bolt carrier group laying around, I probably will find a reason to build a new rifle out of it. Unfortunately, that's the way I am. And while it's perfectly valid to say that a better backup to your spare bolt carrier is a backup rifle, <clears throat> you probably can't carry two rifles with you into, into the field. So this is where having spare parts is helpful is to keep your rifle up and running um, versus you know acting like you're in ghost recon or something and you've got a long arm slung over a long arm over each shoulder and then you're hanging on your hip i'm not saying it can't be done um, but probably not practical for the average person with a limited budget all right let's get to the top of the pyramid the specialty layer all right under specialty this is where first thing is ballistic plates. Uh, I also have night vision. I've also got high-end communications, talking about HF. Uh, we're going to talk a bit more about this. We're talking advanced medical gear and you know, branching off into more specialized weapons. All right. How do I want to think about special? What I'm saying with a special layer is that these are add-on capabilities for the average gun owner. If the average gun owner is following this progression from the basics to patrol to sustain to scout and then fight, the goal would have been that they are learning the skills they need along the way. At some point, something may have interested them enough, they would have looked up at the specialty layer be like, do I need that, right? If someone develops a love of radio, I am not going to sit here and say, no, don't bother ever touching high frequency uh, until you get to the top of the pyramid. No. That's fine. Go pursue it. The goal here is that you're looking at the special layer and saying, all right, that's something I want to add and bring down to my capability that I've got. But it has to be based on do you actually need it. So ballistic plates is a good example of this. Don't buy steel plates. Don't do steel plates. But I think a lot of people, because they feel like they have to buy ballistic protection and ballistic plates are more affordable, they think, well, I have to get it. So I might as well get or the steel plates are more affordable. They think, well, I have to get plates. So I might as well get the steel. No, don't do that. You know, look at these things when other when your other requirements are met. And you're like, hey, I've gotten this far. This is where I'm going to need it. So when it comes to ballistic plates, buy real plates, real actual rated, you know, and tested plates from the United States, not from China, uh, where they say they meet requirements and haven't actually tested their requirements. This is designed to save your life, not the place to 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 try and hunt for a bargain. All right, night vision. I put night vision under special because, again, it's one of those areas that people underestimate the learning curve. Um, without going into all the optics of night visions, they are a fantastic tool. They they really are. They're amazing what they, what they what they can let you do. But it's a learning curve 
to like walk around at night under nods because the way that they focus uh the way that the shadows and things work you're you, you, there's a reason people like to wear helmets <laughs> with their night vision gear all right uh or step into a hole or there's all kinds of things that go wrong so you need to learn how to use your gear all right comp gear i already touched on hf but we're also looking at things um like like building on your SOI. So HF, I'll just throw out here. I mentioned earlier your your line of sight, VHF, UHF radios. This is great for a couple miles or, or longer. So you know, I live in Northern Virginia. Um, this is five watts, my little Yesu FT3. This is five watts. I can hit a repeater that's 30 miles away. Now, granted, the repeater is up on a mountain, which helps. But I can hit a repeater 30 miles away, and that repeater can rebroadcast over a much wider area. But I need the repeater to do that. When you get to high frequency, you do things like bounce your signal off the atmosphere and you can go continents without needing any assistance. You can just broadcast over continents and people can hear each other. Or you get into things like NVIS, near vertical incident skywave, where you aim your antenna almost directly up and it bounces off the ionosphere. And now you've got a hundred miles, hundreds of miles radius around your broadcasting station where people can receive your signal. So it's got some really cool stuff you can do. But then with this, you also want to look at things like brevity matrices, uh, code it. How do you do better encoding of your messages? Uh, I did a podcast a few weeks ago where I hinted at this. We're going to talk a lot more about this in the podcast, not on the YouTube stream. Uh, we're going to talk about, you know, how do you be more secure with your communications? Uh, mesh networking. So Laura Mesh is a really interesting thing now and SIGIN capabilities. Moving on from that. Medical gear. This is where you're talking about people who are like EMT qualified. Um, you get the idea. And then we also want to cap off here with what I call special weapons configuration. So this is, I took a little bit of heat a couple of weeks ago in my talk with, with Doc and Les and Brent because um, I believe the phrase, this was a mental masturbation session over fantasy land. Look, probably not wrong. But the, the point of the conversation was highlighting what other capabilities might there need to be. And from my perspective, the average person can learn how to do a lot of things well just by going through training and competition. If you want to dive off down the rabbit hole and say, you know what? I am not in a good position to be doing things like um, two man tactics, running up and down side of a hill, side of a mountain, you know, um, fire maneuver. Like, like if you got bad knees, you got bad knees. So there's nothing saying that you can't take a scope rifle out there with you and you were the DMR. Right? You're the designated, you're the designated marksman, and this is your rifle. It can be an AR, it can be a three way, it can be a bolt action, it can be a lot of things. The bolt, the point is how you use it, and you have a weapon that supports that. Same goes to being things like the automatic rifleman with a binary trigger or something like that, where you increase your rate of fire. The goal is you're not worried about these super special things, like these extra capabilities, until your point where you can employ them and you understand how they're used, which you will learn from things like the one shepherd schools. Um, force on force training where you see how things actually work um, against other people who are also trying to shoot at you all right that's where the stuff gets really really helpful all right uh, so training then when we get to this this high end here uh, this is where i say you know back to the radio license thing we talked about in the scout layer this is where you get your general license this is this is what lets you use those high frequency band now there is the extra above that for people who are going to be the super super nerds um you know, you can go pretty far with that. This is also where I'd say the brush beater RTO advanced course comes in because that's a lot more, again, using HF, using things like uh, Morse code and ZW or continuous wave, uh, improvising antennas like, like, can you turn a barbed wire fence into an antenna? Yes. Yes, you can. Um, you know, interesting stuff like that. Um, talking about night vision, MVT again has a night operations course dedicated just to doing night vision stuff in the dark, in the woods. Um, not sure where else we learn how to do that kind of thing outside the military itself. Uh, then you get to things like, uh, there's schools all the place to teach you de uh, designated marksman training, precision rifle training. Um, you know, that kind of stuff is everywhere. And then also, I capped this one off with Polaris uh, training simulations. So this is Les, who was on a couple weeks ago. He has something called the Imgen Scout series, which from my reading of it, I have not done this. My reading of it is this is similar to like what what uh, Special Forces does with their whole exercise they do at the end of selection 
where they have to like have a village and you have actors and people who are all into this like simulating what it's going to be like in a conflict so that's a good way to cap everything off again force on force the last thing i threw in here just to get your mind thinking about it is something like a tactical driving course where you learn how to use a vehicle because look we're civilians um, there's a lot to be said for knowing how to drive well especially in northern virginia where nobody knows how to drive well at all so i think there's a lot of benefit to learning how to do it yourself both defensively and offensively if needed all right so that gets to the end of this first portion so i went an hour and 10 minutes thank you for sticking with me now this is where you get to tell me that i'm wrong <laughs> um so let me bring up the chat again all right so let me know what is on your mind here all right so let's go back a little bit t-rex i got that one here we go don't bother getting a 10k by no night vision get a pvs 14 more than enough all right so yeah so um so i'll say shout out here jrh enterprises is where i tend to go shopping for these things he's a great guy and yeah i a lot of people jump for the binos uh binocular and night vision there is nothing wrong with doing singular monocular uh that it's going to be cheaper i mean it's, it's half the price um and you can use both eyes so you can have one eye better better dark adjusted than the other and that can that can help you out Regarding HF, it's one thing to get your signal out to anyone, but getting it to a person you're trying to reach is more complicated, especially at low power. Yes, great point, Denny. Um, so Denny's touching on HF is, is an art into itself. Um, how to how to get out there. Now there's a really cool, there's a really cool competition program out there that of people who love to do this kind of thing. Again, like if, if you think the shooting world is full of like people who want to spend a lot of money and do stuff, you, radio is also ridiculous. Like um, there's a really cool program called Parks on the Air, uh, or yeah, Poda, Soda, Summits on the Air. So Summits on the Air is mountains, Parks on the Air. Anyway, it doesn't matter. What they do is they try to go out to designated positions, like on a map, like at the top of a mountain, or on a hike, or in some kind of park, and the place has an identifier, and they'll use a radio and try and make contacts in places. One of the more fun ones to watch is someone who goes up there with a pretty small antenna and a little tiny box. Now. In this case, they're not going to use voice. They're going to do it with Morse code. Uh, so it's just going to be a long, like a very rapid series of beeps that you have to learn how to do yourself. Um, and at five watts or 10 watts of power, which in radios is not a whole lot, they'll like from New York will hit somebody who's in France. Because um, continuous wave CW Morse code can go a lot further and a lot less power than using voice will. The other interesting thing going on now is digital. Uh, which is also really cool because digital, um, all of my all my radios see here, this one and my, my FT300 back over here, both also on digital, um, very clean audio with less power and modulation. So a lot of really cool things you can do through there. Oh, all right, there you go. One Shepherd does Gen 2 9 Vision. So yeah, you'll learn it there. Yeah, I do believe I saw that in the course descriptions. They do, they do run night vision. All right, I don't predict a complete collapse in our lifetimes, but more possible and realistic is months without rule of law. Of course, when law comes back, beware of decisions you made, choose wisely. Yes, I agree, Pew Pew. This is, this is what I've been saying. This is, this is the theme. You know, look, if you want to get into, you want, like there, there are plenty of places out there that are happy to go down to total society collapse without rule of law. We're going to fight against a tyrannical government. And yeah, they're out there. And they're, they have a lot of really great guys who have, have a lot of great knowledge. It's just not, not my thing, All right? I, I, I don't imagine a world where I'm going to go to war with a conventional force. Um, in my world that I think about and train for and write about is the worst case scenario is some situation where for a period of time, it is your band of unorganized groups or, or partisans or team members, militia, against some other group of unorganized hooligans. We'll call them the bad guys, but it's generally just chaos that we'll eventually recover from. And yes, uh, you need to be aware that one way or another, you're going to be accountable for the decisions you made during all of that. All 
All right, if you get to the level where you are needing that special, you're probably going to need some method of basic sustainment because grocery stores probably aren't getting stocked at that point. Yeah, this is true. If you're getting into a bad enough situation in a you know at a firefight where you need a DMR and you need um, you need squad automatic style weapons, um, yeah, uh, there's a lot of other concerns. This is why I said at the beginning is that what Echo is saying here, this is the stuff you're going to care about a lot earlier than getting into a firefight. You're going to be worrying about things like how do I get food, how do I get fuel, how do I get large enough clean water supply. Where do I get medical supplies? Like if this is dragging on for months, store shelves are not going to help you out. They're not going to stay stocked. They're and they're going to be desperate. So learning how to do these things, how to go find forage food, how do you hunt? How do you process? Food, how do you process game? Especially when you don't have refrigeration. How do you do that stuff? Is going to be extremely important skills that most people gloss over. And honestly, I, I think Doc pointed this out several, well, a little over a month ago. Hunting is a fantastic skill because you learn a lot from hunting, not just that aspect of killing and processing game, but also uh, tracking things like looking for signs, looking for indicators of what's going on in the environment. It's a very, very good skill to have. Yeah, you will also need people trained in long-term trauma care. Yeah, you will. Uh, let's, let's be honest here. Long, if it's bad enough long-term trauma care, sometimes it's just not going to work out. Like if it's If it's as bad as we're imagining right now, and there's someone gets if someone gets shot. Great, you followed your your stop the bleed. You slapped on a chest seal. You stuffed the gauze. You got the tourniquet. But if you've got nowhere to get them to, who can deal with it after that? You still have a problem on your hands. That's that's you know, kind of the way that is. Now I want to point out a topic here that I didn't quite mention before, but is important. In all of this. Um, and this is going to be an upcoming episode of of the podcast as well. Physical fitness plays into all of this because look, look, guys, like gear is fun. Gear is something we all like to talk about and and get suggestions of what would what would be fun to buy. How would I do this? How would I do that? But at the end of the day, the f- man is the first weapon of war. Is the Field Marshal Montgomery, um, and if you yourself are not in a good enough position to be able to to do any of this, then that's where you should work first. All right. Um, you, everybody needs to be thinking about, are they capable of actually surviving? Uh, not to be harsh, but if you're the kind of person who, if the power goes out for two months and your diabetic medication expires in the fridge and you can't get it and you can't get a, a refill, that's a problem. All right. So um, if you're already that, if you're already deep down that rabbit hole, I have no advice for you on that. But if you're someone who is young enough and you know you're on the wrong track, get off that track. All right. You don't want to be doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Here we go. So um, it is, it is, it is important. And, and it's just, it's just, it's just no way around it. Be strong, be fit. So there's a good, a good phrase I, I heard one time. Um, actually it's a combination of phrases, but think of it this way. The amount of ammunition you carry with you is how long you get to stay in the fight, but how fit you are is how long you're going to survive. Period. Uh, great book, Doug, uh, Doug McGuff and John Little have a book called body by science. I, I did a whole review on it and, um, they actually explicitly call out in the book talking about strength and fitness that there is a very strong correlation between how strong the amount of muscle mass someone has, how strong they are, and how long they survive trauma, whether it's a car accident or chronic disease or or you name it. The stronger someone is, the more muscle mass they've got, the longer they survive. And um, that always stuck with me. So, so the phrase uh, I kind of modify is ammo, the amount of ammo you carry will keep you in the firefight. But how fit you are will keep you alive, period. And oh, by the way, benefit to staying staying in the firefight is the more fit you are, the faster you can move <laughs> under load uh, and and get to behind cover, which is also really, really important surviving a firefight. So um, yes, rucking is huge. Running is big. Lifting. Um, I will admit, I said this back in January when I got, when I was talking about my goals for the year, I over the last year, probably overemphasized the strength side of things and neglected the cardio side of things. And now I'm trying to rectify that. But I was reminded um, 
in a conversation with someone who trains how to classes that firefights are a cardio game. It's, it's that get up, get down, sprint, get up, get down, sprint while wearing 20, 30 pounds of gear. All right. So don't neglect your cardio and specifically your sprint cardio and your, and your rucking cardio, how fast can you move under load? Yeah. Oh, it's a great point. Dice is making here about mental fitness. <coughs> um, this is important. And this is a whole separate topic that I want to get into at another day talking about this mental aspect of things. Physical fitness and strength is really important. Um, as is what you know how to do skill wise, the mental game, the mental game to survive. Uh, I had, I had a great interview. I know most people who are watching this story right now probably don't remember this. Don't remember this podcast interview, but it was, a. Uh, Mr. Moore, Sergeant Moore, he was a SEER instructor going back through the Vietnam era. And we had a conversation about survival and you know what kind of survival items he would look for. But part of the conversation was accepting that some people are just going to buckle. Some people have not adequately prepared themselves mentally to deal with the stress of survival and when things go wrong. And there was a rather frank conversation that you have to accept that some people aren't going to do it and you shouldn't let them drain your supplies in the process. That was harsh. And it made me think of a lot of TV shows I've watched where they keep the, the naysaying, the naysaying downer who's just feel like we're all going to die all the time. They keep, he just, they keep them, they keep, keep them around and it doesn't, doesn't go well. Mentally fit. You know, uh, if you, I am not going to knock anybody who is bad with mental with mental health issues. All right, it's a it's a huge issue. I've been around a lot of it in my life. Um, if you need it, get help. All right, if you need help learning how to cope with things, develop those good coping mechanisms. You know, fit, fitness and exercise is one great way to do it. But get that help to be able to deal with it, uh, so that when bad something bad happens, you don't crumble. Because when survival happens, you need to know. You not just think, not hope. Hope is not a valid course of action. You need to know that you're going to get through it, that you're going to survive. And to quote Mr. Sergeant Moore, if for no other reason than to piss off the lawyers, you're going to make it. All right. Now, on that note, I'm going to go ahead and end it here. Thank you for joining me tonight. Um, it's been fun talking to you. I don't do these solo uh, solo episodes very very often. So, um yeah let me know what you thought you know let me know did you like this style uh, a little more of a solo kind of you and me hanging out or do you like the interview style more or a little bit of both um either way i enjoyed hanging out with you all tonight thanks for coming out and on that note i will see you in a couple of weeks so until then have a good night